everyone for joining us today for the ANA eLearning Academy. Today we have Jeff Garrett, past president of the ANA, who will be presenting on pricing rare coins in today's world. You will all be muted for this, so if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A or the chat, and I will read them to Jeff at the end of the presentation. Um, and without further ado, here's Jeff. Go ahead. Okay. Um, thank you, Logan. Um, well, I appreciate everyone uh, joining me today for the pricing rare coins in today's world. And uh, also, I'd like to congratulate the ANA for these ANA uh, eLearning Academy classes. I think that it's uh, really wonderful. I, when I was president of ANA and, and before I was on the board, we struggled for a long time to figure out how to present classes like these uh, because of the platforms are so uh, difficult to build and uh, expensive. And it's really wonderful that uh, Zoom has come along and uh, we've got something we've all kind of learned how to use uh, just in our, in our uh, lives or business or, or different things. And it's uh, uh, being able to something we be able to put together for a and and it's really wonderful. So um, with that, I want to kind of get into uh, what our subject is today and it's, it's pricing rare coins. And uh, I think the pricing, this, this subject is important to anybody who collects coins. So, because if you collect coins, um, you know, likely you're buying some coins, you're not just finding them in circulation. You need to figure out how to uh, use the, the price guides or whatever information you have and determine what is a fair price to pay for a coin or what is a fair asking price if you're uh, going to be selling a coin. And that sounds um, fairly easy to do. It's like look something up and there's, there it is in the book, but it's, it's far from that. It's a very complicated subject. And um, I spend uh, a big part of my career understanding how to price rare coins. And when I say that, uh, I get called almost daily by someone, you know, what should we pay for this coin that's come into a coin shop? Or, you know, how do I figure this collection? Or how do we figure out, um, you know, what to ask for a coin that we've ran across? And it's, uh, I tell people that when I try to buy coins, the, the real art of buying coins is being able to understand what it's really, really worth within about five or 10% of, of, the, of the current value, because anybody can buy a coin for a, a lot less than it's worth, uh, but it's, it's difficult to be able to buy a coin and understand exactly, you know, the, the true, uh, you know, the, you know, getting down to the nitty gritty of what's a, what's a fair price. And also what's not even just fair, but what's the accurate price in today's market, because it changes a lot. So uh, with that, I'm going to start with my going down my slides a little bit. So that kind of the why we need to do this, why is it so important? Because everyone does uh, need this information when they're uh, buying and selling a coin. So what I'm going to talk about a little bit is the history of coin prices in, in America and how that has uh, uh, evolved over the years. So um, my first one, I got a slide um, I've got in my library quite a few old catalogs. And it's, it's really kind of interesting to go back and look and see from, uh, you know, I don't know, back in the, I guess some of the earliest catalogs that I've seen that with pricing coins is probably around the 1850s. Um, coin collecting uh, kind of took off around 1856, 1857, when the 1857 at that time range, when the um, US Mint stopped making large cents. That was like kind of the first coin boom in America. And not too long after that, you started seeing uh, either auction catalogs like this one, or you would see uh, actually fixed price lists with people kind of estimating what coins were worth. Um, and in those days, a lot of the coins that people were interested in were um, early large cents were popular. Also Washington, Washingtonian uh, memorabilia and uh, tokens and colonials that were very popular. So it, it was a long time before people got interested in, in um, you know, I guess kind of the US coins that we kind of collect today. And uh, interesting, it wasn't until around the 1890s that people even cared about mint marks, which that sounds really, um, you know, we find that hard to believe now because that's you know, like a critical component of what a coin is worth. But until uh, the 1890s, when someone published a book about uh, the fact that the coins came from different mints, that people didn't even pay attention to that. They, most people in, um, I guess from about the 1850s to uh, the late 1890s, their, most of their coin collecting was buying coins when they would be uh, U.S. coins when they came from the mint, uh, either in mints, you know, the, I'm sorry, in, in proof sets, they'd buy them either singly or they buy sets of coins from the, from the um, United States government. So proof sets were kind of the first thing that, that normal collectors bought. And the U.S. mint had a price list, what they would sell those for, for a small premium over their, uh, their, their, their face value. Um, now, you know, fast forwarding in about, uh, about 100 years, 
we uh, we get into uh, what I call the uh, early gray sheets. So gray sheets, as as you guys know, are still uh, you know widely used. It's a publication has changed hands a few times, and we'll talk more about that later. But in the um, in the early part of uh, its uh, history, the gray sheet was basically a um, reference of the what was going on what they call the teletype system. So I don't know if anybody is know what the teletype system was, but it's uh, most people have probably forgotten by now. But it was this big old clanky machine that had reams and reams of paper that came out of it, and it would have uh, prices for rolls of coins. and And in, in the nineteen sixties was probably like one of the you know biggest coin booms of all was when they took out uh, silver silver out of our coinage, and that was uh, you know in 1964, 1965. That created a giant demand for people going through their change and trying to find uh, the, the coins that had silver in them. Plus also people were uh, excited about the US uh, silver dollars released by the treasury by the government. So that caused another little boom. But I, from my understand, I think that was probably the highest membership of the ANA it was in that time period, highest uh, circulation of coin world. It was, you know, the coin collecting had a giant boom, which uh, kind of continued even to today. There was some coin, some of the advanced collectors now Kind of got their start in, the, in that uh, bu that big old uh, you know boom of rolls and proof sets and, and things like that. So people they kind of like uh, commoditized coins in a way. I, I went through some of my old catalogs. It's it's kind of interesting to look like um, to look at the old files and mostly what they talk about is mint sets and proof sets, bu rolls and you know very seldom they talk about you know a 1913. Barber half dollar or, or anything like that. So there was what is much interest in, in what we call today, you know, the classic coin issues. It was more in those uh, like commodity type things. And I've talked to some friends that kind of lived through that time period and they would go to uh, a coin show and some of the guys that like really dealt mint sets and proof sets would have like a big blackboard and uh, I'd be paying, you know, $80 for a 1950 proof set or I don't know what it was, but then you know, later in the show, they'd be paying $82. It would be like, um, almost like a, a commodity exchange or a, or a stock exchange for coins. And this teletype system, um, and, and believe it or not, the teletype system still exists today. Um, people call it, uh, they call it, I guess it's the CCE, which we'll talk about later, but it's kind of morphed over the years. They don't have the big clunky machines anymore, but it's all on the computers or on your, on your phones. So that's kind of, um, you know, that, uh, you know, it's, that's the beginning of the gray sheet, but I say it's still a very, very important day. And we'll talk about that later on in the discussion. Um, in my office, because uh, pricing is very, very important to me, and um, I like to also like to study the history of how coins are priced because that also gives you trends and things like that. Um, I have in my office pretty much all of the gray sheets. I, I keep them in, a, in this in this one big filing cabinet. All the gray sheets that came out, um, I think probably from about. I think the late seventies, uh, probably about mid to late seventies, when I first started subscribing to it. And I still keep them uh, through today. Now today, uh, Gray Sheet is is a monthly magazine, so it's not a weekly. Uh, you know, this little thing you get in the mail anymore. So it's it has changed dramatically in the last uh, couple of years. But I still keep these old files. Interestingly enough, I I bought recently uh, a hoard of a commemorative half dollar, and it's you know I had about you know seven or eight hundred of these coins. It was one of the classic commemoratives. And I was interested to see uh, someone was pricing the coin to me at around gray sheet bid. But I was curious to know is in the last 10 years, has someone tried to manipulate the price of that coin, like make it go up and, and see its, its price history. So by having those gray sheets in my file, I was able to pull, you know, go back a couple of years, you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years. And I was able to uh, convince myself by going through the files that the, the, that coin had stayed steady no one had uh, artificially ran it up in price, but that was good information to have as, as far as a background. Um, I do know if you're interested, uh, the company, uh, the Gray Sheet, that's that's uh, that's still the successor company that owns it. They do sell back issues of Gray Sheet, and I think you can buy, um, you know, pretty much all everything's digitized. I think they've copied everything. And if you wanted to go back, if you, you know, love commemorative half dollars, and for instance, you could go in and you know see some of the price history and study back. And, and that's kind of a um, almost a comical one to go back and look because uh, price of commemorative half dollars now, if you look at a 1989 gray sheet when the, the grading services first started, first started grading coins, uh, the price of uh, commemorative half dollars were in many cases 10 times what they are today. 
So it's, you know, a coin that was $5,000 now is $500. So I think you can get, um, you know, seeing the history, like where coins have been, it does, doesn't tell you where they're going to go, but it gives you some clues about, uh, about you know, how guys get studying, you know, people like stocks, a lot of people like to see history and things like that. So I'm, I'm into the numbers, I like to crunch them. And sometimes I pull these old sheets out to see where coins were. Uh, one thing, it's another interesting thing I do occasionally is, I have some gray sheets. When when gold went to a thousand dollars for the first time, um, I see what the price of generic gold coins are and, or were at the time, the premiums attached to them. Then I have a, another sheet where gold went to fifteen hundred dollars. So I, I like to study that and see where the premiums are. And then gold went to about two thousand dollars, and then today we're around seventeen hundreds. And you can see the fluctuations of those premiums do dramatically change. And it changes not just across the board, but some series are more than others. And I think you can really learn a lot by looking at the at those kind of histories. So it's a I, I do think that's 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 something. So if you're if you have a specialty in this series, you might uh, consider looking at historical pricing. And that's in the gray sheets are a great way, great way to do that. Now um, the red book. This is uh, a really important. Uh, uh, I guess just stuff, stuffs about the history of, of pricing. So the the red book. It was first published in 1946. I think 47 was maybe the first editions that came out. Um, this year is going to be the the 2022 is going to be the 75th 75th edition of the Red Book. Um, and then uh, I, you know, did when I was talking to Dennis Tucker, the the my the, my editor, uh, the the or the publisher for uh, Whitman Publishing, he was telling me recently that uh, 25 million copies of the Red Book have been sold to date which is really, um, you think about it, that's one of the top selling nonfiction books you know, of all time. It really ranks way up there as far as longevity. And the last I heard, um, I think the Red Book still sells between four and 500,000 copies, which is really a giant number of, uh, of books that come out uh, in a year. And it does help promote the hobby a lot because it's in uh, almost every bookstore. It's uh, sold online uh, widely. And, uh, you know, anybody that that uh, has a, you know, I'd say anyone who's just get interested in coins is probably for most people, it's one of their first introductions to coins. And, uh, you know, it's not called the Bible of Numismatics for nothing. And it's uh, it has a lot of information in it that's that's really, really helpful. And, you know, a lot of you are probably like, uh, you know, people I know myself, uh, even in a way, you know, we get each edition each year, but we don't always dig into it and see what's new. Um, I became the senior editor of Red Book uh, three, four years ago, and we try to, uh, you know, work with my team and we try to make sure there's there's new information at each time. And I do highly recommend just don't just don't get your new edition of Red Book and just put it on your desk. Actually, go through and read it and uh, look at the good information that's in there. Um, of course, it is a, a, a price guide, so it's uh, primarily it's that's its main purpose is is the pricing. But it does have a lot of information about minages that are, you know, I think it's the go-to source for most people for minages because they they do a really good job and uh, work on making sure that that, that is accurate. And um, also pricing, uh, that's that's probably, I guess, 90% of the job that I do for the Red Book. Uh, when I work on the, uh, working on it, I, you know, that's kind of like my November, December project and we kind of clean it up in January and then around February, March, it, it, it goes to press. Then it comes out around April. But it's, it's a big job to, to um, you can imagine, I, I pretty much do the pricing, finalize the pricing for every United States coin from uh, colonials, from the, you know, the very early 1600 issues up to the modern coins. And uh, also all denominations, we're doing the uh, colonials, you know, large cents, small cents, you know, nickels, you know, dimes, quarters, halves, dollars, and all the all the gold coins. So it's it is quite the task. And uh, luckily, I've built a really good team over the over the years. And this next slide will tell, show you. Um, for the last uh, red book that I had, we had over a hundred contributors. And what I've done over the years with the contributor system is I've worked to have specialists. Um, you know, going back into the past, some people would go in and just like pick in and like just throw in some prices and, you know, get their name of the book. But I've, I've tried to raise the bar so that if you're going to participate as a contributor, um, I want you to pick a specialty and I want you to price those uh, those series very, very thoroughly. And to because uh, I need to lean on people, uh, you know, I'm I'm a you know, I'm a pretty expert about most United States coins. 
but I'm not a I'm not a super expert on let's say seeded coinage that uh, there may be you know nuances about that I I, I need to have uh, people's uh, uh, you know current knowledge on it. And I'll talk about it a little bit later on about the importance of having uh, experts in different series to help you with uh, with pricing. But the uh, the Red Book does a great job as far as um, reaching out to the people and uh, having their input, uh, finding out what series that they're they're interested in. Um, the one thing that uh, I do as a senior editor, of course, if you know if you're an expert, let's say in um, I don't know, let's say you know Morgan Silver Dollars. Or you know even like Lincoln pennies or everything, um, I I have to uh, edit those and make sure that somebody's you know putting in high prices just because they want to promote you know that series to unrealistic levels. So we 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 try to um, you know most series we try to have multiple experts. Uh, it's good to weigh that out, and uh, I'm very very proud of the Red Book pricing. So um, it, a lot of people don't use it as much as for pricing as some of the other guides because they come out on a weekly basis or a monthly basis compared to the red book which comes out annually but for an annual price guide i i feel it's it's uh, extremely accurate and almost always i think the prices hold up if you look at them from a, you know for a retail perspective over over the long term so um, i think it's good and i think you can see why you know having 100 contributors um, most other price guides have one or two people that put those together and i think a team of 100 you can see that um, you can you know really get uh, you know drill down and work on specialties and also sometimes the uh, scholarship will change um, in colonial coinage. For instance, we've had two or three coins that people look at them differently now based on recent research. The continental dollar is a good example. That, that coin, um, you know, for years and, you know, for, I don't know, decades, we'll say, if, if not longer, that coin was considered made in, made in the Americas. And now a lot of the experts consider that coin was a metal made in either Germany or England and uh, around that time period and, and never really circulated. So, that coin has been, the scholarship has been, uh, you know, updated in the book and things like that are very, very important to have, have somebody that's uh, going through the information and, and make sure it's being updated uh, to the very best it, it can. So moving on, um, the next one, uh, one of the other price guides that has really popular from the past is the um, uh, BMAX Mel. He he kind of made his, a lot of people, you know, you hear about B Max Mel is like selling all these great coins and he, he did, you know, $1,804 and 13 nickels, you know, he advertised to, you know, to buy them and, you know, that was his big thing. But, you know, he advertised to buy the 1913 nickel for, I think, $500 or whatever it was, but he knew there were none available. But his real thing was he was um, uh, selling this, this star catalog and he sold thousands of them. And so his was really one of the first wildly, uh, you know, from a price guide standpoint, probably the most widely disseminated uh, price guide, maybe in the history of coins. I mean, going way back, I mean, he had a staff of two or 300 people during the depression, filling orders, selling these catalogs. So I, I know he was probably a big dealer and he did a lot of stuff, but he did, he was a publisher, probably primarily. And if you look at this catalog here, uh, price $1. So uh, for a little book could be priced for $1, in, in the 1930s, uh, that was a pretty big, big amount. But people, what they were doing, they were desperate to go through and, and look through their coins and be able to find something that B Max Mel would pay them, you know, five hundred dollars for or a thousand dollars for or some big coin. So he promoted the idea of, of um, finding something good in circulation or that you might have in, in your your collection. And his price guide was it's it's kind of fun. It's the books are actually fairly sophisticated for the 1930s and 1940s, and they're kind of fun to go through. And if you get a chance, they're, they're, since they made so many of them, you can buy them uh, pretty inexpensively. They're they, they're not a, you know probably probably not much more than a dollar now in some cases if you go to a, uh, some of the some of the uh, book dealers. So it's kind of a fun thing if you want to see nostalgia and also kind of you know look back and see what you know what was considered rare in those days and what people would pay for things. But it's a it's, it is a fun book, and he was very important person in the in the history of of the coin business. Um, now we're moving forward uh, a little bit more, kind of now into uh, an area that, uh, or a time frame, that really impacted my life more, and uh, you know even today it was a big influence on on the things that I do. So in the uh, late 1970s, uh, David Akers, which was um, at Paramount Coins at the time, was one of the great coin dealers of the era, and uh, he was a you know wonderful you know wonderful guy, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. 
And he came up with a series of gold um, coin books. It was uh, his first one that came out was gold dollars. Then later he did a similar book on uh, two and a half dollar gold pieces and then uh, threes and, uh, and then fives, tens, and then 20. So it was a series of about five or six books. And <clears throat> this book was groundbreaking at the time. So when this book first came out, you know, most people really relied on the, um, uh, on the red book for their pricing. That was really what people, most people use. I, mean, I remember back in the late seventies, when I was first getting started, I'd go to a coin shop and there would be like, somebody would have coins they were gonna sell and they didn't wanna price it. They would actually keep their coins and wait till the new red book came out to find out what the new price was gonna be. So it was, you know, see how influential it was. And that was kind of like the guide, but that guidebook in the, in the late seventies for the red book was, was fairly unsophisticated. So Dave Akers took uh, coin, uh, coin information and, uh, uh, you know, I guess, research to a new level with this, with this book. When these books came out, these were really had a big impact on me as far as I would study them at night. I mean, I love gold coins. I still love gold coins. And that's one of the things I would, uh, you know, I, I realized, you know, very early on in my career how important having knowledge was. And this book was a wealth of knowledge. And what he would do is there... He, he, he went in and did these, what I call auction records at the time. And then he didn't really uh, put in prices, which is, you know, come in, we'll talk about much, much later on uh, about how much more important that is later, you know, later to, as today. But he would, um, like you would see this 1850 D gold dollar. So he went there, he would said there were seven uncirculated coins that, that were offered. Like, you know, I think his time period there was like the 1940s through about the, the late 1970s. So you can see most like the most later ones there, there, there would have been current around the, in the 1970s. <clears throat> so he would said, you know, seven of them that were offered at auction were uncirculated and then, you know, so forth and so on with the AUs, the XF, very fine and fine. Um, now this is well, way before people did the Sheldon grading scale. So this was more kind of how coins were, were cataloged in those days. And then he would put a commentary there about his observations about what he thought the coin, you know, um, you know, better date manage and, you know, so forth and so on. And then um, he put the number of appearances, there were 61 total. Um, and then he put in the average grade and they also had to, had to manage. So this was very, very interesting because for the first time, I don't, I don't have an example of a page there, but there would be a lot of coins where, uh, let's say a, a, a good example would be like a, 1866 S uh, double eagle in mint, mint condition in no motto. That coin doesn't exist in mint condition, but it would would have still been in the price guide. Someone just guessed a price of what one was worth. But because of the Dave Baker's books, you could see that, hey, this coin's really, really, you know, it's unknown in mint, and no one's ever seen a, a mint condition coin. So that gives you a whole different appreciation of its rarity. And he did that for all United States gold coins. And um, it was groundbreaking as far as information and uh, understanding about the true value that, you know, the true, not, not as val much value, more about the rarity. So it was a great book to understand rarity. And, um, you know, in those time periods, um, you know, and I'll, I'll speak to this uh, later on, you as collectors now, anybody's watching this or will be watching it, um, you're so lucky because there's so much more information available for, for modern collectors than there were back in the 70s and the, and the early 80s. So this was, uh, you know, this was a big leap from the Red Book. And you can see how much more information was there for you to be able to look at. Um, one other thing that I uh, also studied too, and you can see kind of going back to this, some of these catalogs that Dave Akers referred to. Um, I have a large collection. I've been collecting auction catalogs for, for years and years and years. And I've got pretty much every, every major auction catalog in my library from like the 19, you know, the mid seventies uh, up to date. Um, now my library is actually getting pretty big and I'm kind of like running out of some space, especially like heritage catalogs and some of the stacks Bowers. And a lot of people don't really collect those as much anymore because they've been, that information is available digitally. And most actually auction catalogs now are available digitally, uh, either through, uh, the ANS's website or the Newman portal and a few other places, um, that you can go to for the older stuff. And anything, I would say anything that's auctioned in the last 20 years, you can go to the companies themselves for that information. So you can, uh, the digitization is really made a big, big difference as far as uh, looking up retail, looking up, you know, examples of coin selling. The, uh, I put that on the left there, you'll see the George Walton catalog. Uh, George Walton, if you may remember, 
was the gentleman who owned a 1913 Liberty Nickel that had gone missing for like 40 years. Um, when he died, his uh, he died in a car a car, automobile accident. And uh, George Walton's uh, collection had a very extensive collection. I think it sold for almost a million dollars in the 1960s. And that was without the 1913 nickel that the family had um, uh, misdiagnosed as a, as a counterfeit and had it sit in a closet for, for decades, which they later sold for $3 million. So uh, it's kind of what, for, for me as a researcher, it's really kind of interesting to go back and because I, I actually handled the 1913 Walton nickel. And it was fun for me to go back and see what was originally in his collection and kind of think about, gave me a better sense of who he was and what he bought. And he, he loved, uh, you know, Beckler gold coins, had nearly a complete collection and uh, kind of gives you just, you know, it's good to go back and see some of these great collections. Um, and I still enjoy doing that, going back and see, you know, go, you know studying uh, some of these historic collections that have, that have sold. Uh, they still happens now, but going back in the old days, it is it is fun to view those. And, you know, they're, they're very inexpensive. Most catalogs you can get for a few dollars. And if you uh, have it, especially if you have an interest in a, in a series that you specialize in, let's say large sets, um, uh, you could go in and uh, buy some of the, all some of the, you know, I would recommend it would be great for historical information and pricing is to buy the historical catalogs of some of the great large scent collections that have been sold. And you could do the same thing with silver dollars or, or other things like that. So you don't have to have all the old great catalogs, but you could definitely research and assemble some of the ones that you had had that pertain to the series that you collect. So I think you'd find that that would be valuable for you as a resource. Um, now we're gonna to get to the subject that most people are probably on here to watch today is rare coin pricing today. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, pricing rare coins is what I do. Uh, it's primarily the, you know, the main focus of how I am a professional numismatist. It's a job that most people who are professionals need to understand um, because when we're, we've asked to buy a coin, we need to understand what to pay for it because if we don't pay enough for coins, we won't be able to buy enough coins. And if we pay too much, we'll obviously go out of business. So I, I call it kind of like micro pricing. You have to become you know, so good at it that you uh, understand really what the current market price on things almost on a daily basis, sometimes hourly in the case of uh, bullion related coins. So it's um, much different than it was back uh, decades ago. You know, instead of waiting for a book to come out once a year, now you're you know, looking at information that comes out on a, a daily or weekly basis that, that, that uh, affects your, your buying decisions. Um, you know, um, the, it also, it's a, um, you know, something that, uh, you know, like I say, this book, the guidebook is, you know, what I, I work on all the series. I have expertise in all the series, but a lot of people, when they try to uh, learn how to do pricing, kind of do a specialize in a series. So we can talk about that a little bit more. And um, one thing I do recommend if you're watching this and if you're a coin collector, um, you know, try to put as much focus as you can. The, the more you can focus on one or two series that you're into and become, you know, I wouldn't say, you know, maybe an expert, but the more information you know and understand, the, the more successful you'll be as a, as a collector. It's very, very important to, to uh, get as much knowledge as you can and uh, just don't take everyone's word for it. Just make sure you do your own research. Um, uh, accurate pricing, like I say here, is more difficult to achieve than you might assume because even though there are lots and lots of resources, there's conflicting information. And the most important thing uh, and that we'll be talking about is that rare coins are not commodities. Um, every 1901 Morgan dollar and MS63 does not look alike. So that is, um, you know, you can take that as, if you got one big lesson to learn today is to understand that rare coins um, are more like art than they are a commodity. They they all look different. Um, virtually, it may be imperceptible to you as a maybe an amateur collector, but I can tell you experts um, can, you know, if you gave them 10 coins of the same grade, they could probably line them up from number one to number 10, as far as, uh, you know, attractiveness or, you know, desirability and, and things like that. So the, um, that's, a, that's a very, very important part to, of this lesson you'll learn today is about trying to figure out the difference between uh, high end, low end, medium, and, and things like that. So um, that's what we're going to be uh be talking about uh, today is, is more about how to, uh, you know, use the price guides, but understand that there, there are tools that you need to use, but you need to also understand how to use them. 
Um, so when you talk about valuations, um, nearly every coin is different. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that uh, a little bit later with photography um, for even the same grades. You can get coins that, uh, you know, some people, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about gradeflation. You hear about talk, people talk about old green holders, coins that were, you know, graded in the 1980s, how they're, you know, so much more conservatively graded than coins that are graded today. But, you know, I know some people think coins are graded today are being more conservative than they were a few years ago. So it's, um, it's kind of nuanced when it comes to that. But <clears throat> you don't have to be turned off by that because what you need to do is you may be able to learn it and understand it and use it to your advantage. Because when you're buying coins out there, the more information you have and the more you understand it, the better chance you'll be able to have to be able to uh, get a good value for what you're, what you're buying. Um, right now in the coin market, um, eye appeal and general appearance are, are not just very important, they're critically important. And the coin market in the last, uh, I'd say that I'd explain it to you, in the last 10 years or so, coin collecting has been being more dominated by collectors and versus investors. So at different times in the uh, history of coins, when you see coin booms and, and things that, that, that may happen, um, coin, coin investors kind of bought what they're told to buy and they're given advice to buy. They don't understand something. They haven't spent you know years or, or, or different uh, experience in buying something. They don't understand the difference between, they, they see a catalog value of $10,000 for a coin and they think, oh, well, if I get that for 9,000, that's a great investment. Um, as you, probably most of you realize, that's probably not the case. And uh, eye appeal has become uh, <clears throat> really, uh, I think, one of the more important issues that you need to understand. Because uh, when you see coins sell, how a coin looks now is more important than it's. It's really even more important than it was a few years ago. Just, just, just more recently, people are really paying. They're paying up for coins that, that are very, very attractive. And you can see that with like CAC coins. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that uh, later on more, more detail. But anyway, IPL and, and the way a coin looks is, is does have a big impact on its uh, way it looks. Um, price guides don't, oh, you know, I, I struggle with this a lot when I do prices for Red Book. So price guides can only give you one price. We don't have the room in Red Book or even online or anywhere to be able to say, um, a, uh, you, know, you know, a 1904 Morgan dollar and MS-63 can be worth $50, $60, $80, or $100. And that would, first of all, be confusing. And um, that's, that's not the way, you know, the price guides work. Price guides, you know, I know for the Red Book, and I could probably speak for most of the other price guides, uh, people who do those, price guides are for the theoretically average coin. So you can imagine what that, you know, you have to probably think about that. Um, but that is what that is what that is for. So it's not a coin that's low end. It's not a, co a coin that's high end. Um, it's a coin that would be theoretically like have decent eye appeal, uh, not damaged, you know, no, no, uh, you know, not not ugly toning, not not beautiful toning. So, you know, something that's kind of average. So you gotta, when you look at price guides, you kind of got to think of it in, in those terms. Um, but uh, with that being said, though, you can you can drill down more when you do figure out uh valuations on coins. You can look at a price guide, but then you have a lot of other resources. Um, and the ones I've listed there are someone or auction records, probably I would say auction records and population population information uh, is is that are the two really, really big ones. And the, the auction records are good because now that you can do things digitally, you can also not just see what a coin brought when it sold for that price, you can actually see a nice photograph of the coin in most cases, and it can give you a, a sense of what the, what that coin looked like, and how it uh, it, it uh, performed at auction, based on its other we call it peers, other coins that are that look like it uh, that might have sold at the same time. Um, and the population information is very 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 important, and uh, I will that's a, that's another uh, thing that we'll talk about uh, as we move further into the into the presentation day because that's a, that's very very important, especially if you're doing a set registries, or if you're doing expensive coins, but it, it even applies to inexpensive coins. And, you know, today's uh, lesson, I'd like to make sure that you don't think it's just for high end or expensive coins like this, you can be spending $100 a month on coins and that all this information is very, very important to you, you know, equally because um, you, you know, regardless of what you pay for a coin, it's important that you, you, you kind of try to buy at the right price, or also conversely sell at the right price. So it's, it's, it's very important. Um, 
and when I say here, these resources we have today um, makes the hobby more transparent. Um, it's really what has made coin collecting great and um, made our hobby grow as much as it has in the last 20 years. The internet has given us access to so many more tools than we had, um, you know, back, like I said, back in the 70s and 80s. Um, there's, uh, there, you can find out so much about a coin. It's, you know, history, it's stories, all those kind of things by doing a little bit of research. And with that research, it's the hobby is, is uh, and the pricing tools, the hobby is more transparent, probably about any other hobby. Anybody that collects almost anything else, I think when I talk to other people in other fields, they're, they're all like kind of envious of coin collecting because of, of the uh, information that collectors can, can use now. And um, I tell a lot of people, I, I mentioned this to someone today, we were discussing about books and information and, and uh, trying to provide information when we you know, do sales and things like that. The more information that a buyer has, including probably your, 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 your ones that are watching this uh, today, the more comfortable you will feel spending money on your, your in, when you're, even though you're collecting it, it's still an investment ultimately, because when you, if you spend enough money, someday you would kind of hope that that, that, uh, that's that money you've spent was, uh, you know, will, uh, you know, show at least, you know, a, a decent return. It was worth your trouble in doing it. So uh, having that information does give you a lot, lot, lot more tools and it'll, it'll help make you for, uh, you know, more successful down the road. Okay. Um, so this is this is going to be start here, you know, because it's so important to give you ideas about uh, you know how how coins look. So here's an example of the same coin in the same grade that sold about the same time and uh, for about a fifty percent difference in price. So you see that an eighteen eighty nine uh, O Morgan dollar in MS sixty six um, and this coin you know wasn't ugly by any means, but it was dark around the periphery, uh, kind of hazy in the middle. And then the coin on the right was a, a blast white coin and it sold for $14,000 versus $9,000 for the for the heavily toned coin. Um, now, it's kind of interesting because I've, uh, I've written articles about this before that, you know, a lot of coin collectors say that they want just totally original undipped coins. But when it, when the, when you look at the Performance of coins, most people seems like they'll pay more for coins that are that are actually probably been dipped at some point in its history because these coins didn't most likely get struck in 1889 and stay this white, you know, its entire entire life. So um, you can see that uh, you know most people do prefer a coin. I, I tell people there's two different coins. You've got probably about 20% of all coins are, are frosty white and attractive. You probably got about five or ten percent of the coins that have beautiful color. And then you have about uh, 70 or 80 percent of coins that, that fill that gap that are, that are what we call more average or, or unattractive or, you know, um, you know, not one of those two ends of the spectrums uh, of being a, a desirable. So uh, when you do see a coin that actually falls into those ranges, especially there are some some coins that that mostly don't only come, you know, don't come very attractive. It's a, and that's that's more of a nuance you'll find for the different series you should collect. But there's some coins that are. You know, seldom come you know white and frosty or or attractively toned. Um, now, this is a subject you know, that's probably um, when it comes down how to price coins. It, this is probably one of the um, biggest reasons you'd want to watch a, like a class like today is to understand the difference between wholesale and retail, and that can be. Um, uh, get that. That that can be very very confusing because of all the tools that are available out there today, um, you as a collector have almost the same tools as most coin dealers have as professionals. So that kind of blurs the line between um, you know what uh, you know what information like there is no you know like the gray sheet for instance anybody can subscribe to it. You don't have to prove you're a coin dealer to get the gray sheet. Um, you don't have to prove your coin dealer to see Heritage's auction prices realized. They, they want collectors to see that information. And um, because there's so much information out there, you know, what is a, you know, like the Red Book is a retail price guide. They've got, you know, the professional Red Book. Uh, NGC and PCGS have their online price guides. You know, there, there's a lot of different price guides. Numismatic News, uh, as I that listed, Coin Rolls Trends were, you know, very, very important. Those, a lot of people have used those for years and years and years. And there's, there's many, many others. There's, there's different books that get either published um, on a, 
you know, weekly basis, monthly basis. You know, there's some things that are done uh, online, you know, much more, much more often. Um, as a matter of fact, the gray sheet, um, sorry, the gray sheet now has a, what they call their um, consumer price guide. So they have a book uh, that is uh, supposedly retail prices. The, uh, the concept, their price guide is based on kind of the, the gray sheet. They use that same database for the gray sheet prices, but they have different percentages uh, keyed in and they'll, they'll have a coin that gray sheet bid is $100, but retail is 122, or they got some kind of, you know, uh, algorithm that they've, they've set up to being able to uh, come up with those, those prices. And I'll explain that a little bit more how that, how that works. But um, so the difference between these days between retail and wholesale it's changed uh, quite a bit. It's used to be like, you know, coin dealers, like you can only, you know, everyone had gray sheets and they tried to discourage uh, collectors seeing that. And they had used a, you know, red book or, or a different price guide. Now it's kind of retail. But um, as people get more sophisticated and you have all these tools now, you can use those to your advantage when either buying a coin or selling a coin as well when you sell it back to somebody or another, another collector. Um, surprisingly, uh, Google is a uh, really powerful. I've you know been a few times where I thought you had to like go in and like uh, you know use one of these search engines at like one of these specialized coin places. But you can just you can just Google a 1921 piece dollar and you can see people selling it. And you can see auction records. I mean, they that uh, Google is a very powerful tool, and um, you can get in there and you can you know use that uh, to to do a lot of um, price discovery for things that you want to try to uh, to, to find out. Um, so I'll, I'm going to go give now probably one of the more important uh, you know, pieces of information about wholesale versus retail. So, and this is this is my philosophy when I when I do the pricing for Redbook. So uh, this is very very important to understand. So for when I price in the Redbook, I'll give you for instance an 1881s Morgan dollar uh, in MS65. Now that coin exists by the tens of thousands. There's lots of them out there. And if you wanted to buy 50 of them, you could probably find them you know, within a week. Um, that coin is gonna have a, a lower uh, suggested markup or not suggested markup is maybe the word for it, but a, a price that let's say wholesale is $125 in that coin. So I would probably put that coin retail at like $150 or $160 somewhere you know, in that probably $150 range because that coin's closer to a commodity than let's say you're looking for, we'll kind of step it up. We'll go for next the next step. Let's say you're looking for an 1887 S silver dollar. So if you want an 1887 S silver dollar in MS64 and you've decided you only like frosty white, you don't want a tone coin. Um, let's say you only want PCGS um, and to another extreme, you only want CAC coin. So even though that coin's ingratiated, let's say $450, I don't, I don't have it in front of me, but let's say it's $450, you're not going to be able to buy that coin for a 10 or 20% premium over the wholesale price. Uh, because first of all, it would probably bring more than the wholesale price if, uh, if you had to try to you know, buy that, you know, trade it dealer to dealer. And the, 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 if you wanted to buy one of those coins versus 50 to 81 S's, you, know, you, might, you might be lucky to buy one this year of that coin, you've been looking at all sources everywhere. So when you do finally find it and a dealer who specializes in silver dollars, he's gonna want a premium for that coin because he knows that there's a lot of people looking for those kind of coins and he's gonna charge a higher higher percentage. Um, now taking it up to the next level, let's say you have an 1887 uh, S silver dollar and MS66 plus, let's say, and I don't know the population report on it, but let's say there's only you know one known or two known. Well, you can almost uh, throw out the price guides because even the even the retail red book price or the uh, or the or the uh, any of these other price guides, you know that coin is going to sell what two willing buyers are going to be willing to pay for it, and um, either a willing seller uh, or a willing buyer. And, and if it goes in auction, it uh, if there's only one or two ever been graded to that coin. And you've got some set registry people who are who are after it, and um, you know you have a heated auction. It can bring two to three times the most recent price guide. So um, the the big message to to learn on this is price guides are very specific to how rare a coin is. 
So you need to understand, and we'll we'll talk about that here shortly a bit, a bit more. Kind of like when you do these, you need to also understand how to use the population reports and how it applies to the series that you're interested in. Um, and if you're just a, you know, a, you know, beginner collector and you're just collecting uh, Lincoln pennies and, and, you know, very fine to extra fine, it's not going to be a big concern to you. But if you've graduated and you're buying uh, certified Lincoln pennies and you want to buy MS64 and better coins, you know, this is very, very important information for you to understand the tools and, and how it works because, you um, it, it'll it'll impact, you know, you'll get frustrated, you'll see a coin that's, you know, they want way too much you think for, but then I've had clients that pass on coins that are way too much and then two years later they're still working for a coin and they go back to buy that coin that's not available anymore. So it's, um, you have to you have to understand the uh, price guides versus opportunities when, when they come your way. So you have to, uh, you have to uh, do understand that. So it is, uh, wholesale versus retail is, um, uh, it's almost a controversial subject because a lot of coin dealers, you know, they um, they want to have profit margins. They need to make some money to be able to stay in business. But then the whole, they're not the only ones that are being affected by, um, we say, the, uh, the the shrinking of margins in the United States. The, the internet has become such a powerful tool that if you're a collector or really just a consumer of anything, even if you want to buy a car, you can use the tools now of the internet um, as, as a, a very powerful tool to help you either negotiate prices, either when you're selling or when you're buying. So the more information you have uh, when you're ready to make those decisions, the, the, you know, the more you know, successful you'll be about that. Okay, um, so next, um, as we mentioned earlier about gray sheet and blue sheet. So this will be, um, you know, gray sheet's been around since I think the 1960s. Um, so it's been around now for over 60 years. The gray sheet's still um, a, a widely used tool. Um, some people criticize it because they, you know, say the prices are this or that. They don't like it's too high, too low. You know, I, I <clears throat> you know, like say what I do with a red book. I mean, you get, you, you can't make everyone happy because like I said, they're, it's really an impossible task because every coin is different and all you're doing is giving a price uh, estimation for the theoretical uh, average coin. And when you do that, um, you know, they, there's a lot of different, you know, uh, things that come into play. So some people, uh, I'm, not, I'm not depending on what level you are as a collector or a dealer, uh, depending who's watching this, but um, kind of aim this more toward collectors. So a, uh, you might say, what's the difference between gray sheet and blue sheet? Um, well, they're right now, they, they used to be published separately. So now they're in the same book. And theoretically, what a, uh, and I don't have their definitions, I should have maybe uh, pulled that together, but I can tell you from a practical standpoint, this, this little chart here gives you quite a bit of, uh, it also has the CAC pricing information. So there's, you, you'll see there, um, so MS64 coin, uh, and 18, there's three different prices quoted here. Actually, I'm sorry, four different prices for the same coin. So you have a uh, 1878 eight tail feather silver dollar in MS64. You have one price guide you'll see of $405 for a gray sheet bid of for a, a, a $1878, 405. The CAC bid is 455. Then you go back a little bit down further, you see the um, blue sheet price for the PCGS coin is 345. And then they have the same coin I'm sorry, the 1878 A-tail feather, MS64, 345 for an NGC coin. So, and then they, those prices, they, the, the, the PC and the, the NGC prices can, can vary depending on who's uh, act, putting active bids up on coins. Sometimes it's, it's a more uh, radical difference you'll see, like, so the MS65s or MS66s. So what's going on here is you're kind of going back to where I talked about earlier. So to understand how to use this, the the gray sheet is 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 kind of set up for a you know theoretically average or better coin. So a coin that like okay that coin's nice. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, you know that MS64 dollar doesn't have a splotchy toning on the front. Doesn't have a rim nick that's kind of distracting. It's 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 like it's a it's a nice looking coin. The CAC price is for you know that's a whole different universe. There's people who only want to buy CAC coins. And uh, there's people that put bids for CAC coins, and that's kind of like their their price. They say I'll pay that for 
you know, I would pay that for, you know, if it's got a CAC sticker on it, that's what I would pay for it. You know, that's, we, we trust that grade. Now that you go down a little bit further, uh, down further, now the blue sheet, the blue sheet is meant more for kind of like the, um, I wouldn't call it low end, but uh, I mean, actually what it means is site, site uh, unseen bids. So that means that's what you're willing to pay for that coin. I think that's what it, it's, it, so they're going back for a little bit. I remember it now. The, uh, the gray sheet prices are site seen prices. Like you, I'll pay that price of the coin, but I need to see it first, make sure it meets my standards. The, the prices below that are intended to reflect uh, people who post bids on the on the different systems like the CCE or the what they call Teletype or CDN Exchange, some of these other systems. This is what I would pay for a coin, um, basically uh, with without seeing it. I trust the grading services. It's you know they said it's MS64. I'll buy it for three forty five, even though it's got a splotch on the front or a nick on the back. Um, that's what I would pay for it. You know based on on that, those parameters. And you, as you can see, those prices are less. And um, in, in most cases, you know, those, those people, you know, on, on the blue sheet, you know, I would say most people try to use the gray sheet prices, the pros of blue sheet, because it is lower prices, but the, it does give you an idea of kind of like the worst case scenario for some of the coins that, that they may be, they may be worth. And also just as a re reminder, these are all price guides. They, they are, you can't sell your coins to Mr. Gray Sheet. Um, you can't sell your coins to Mr. Blue Sheet or or, or, or uh, Green Sheet or whatever it is. These are these are uh, uh, or, or, or estimations. Now, if you're on one of the systems, you could maybe you know if you pay a subscription to belong to these services, there are ways to sell coins uh, sight unseen to in the and they have they are set up for those those kind of systems. Um, you know, I belong to them, uh, but I can tell you in most cases, I don't sell coins at sight unseen prices because I don't want to sell them at a discount. I'd rather take them to a coin show and show them to somebody that like, okay, that may have a little splotch in the front, but I don't think it's too bad. So I'll pay closer to the gray sheet price than I would the blue sheet price. Or if it's a really nice coin, I can sell for 30% more than gray sheet because the hey, coin is really attractive. So, um, you know, in the past there has been, I would, you know, I don't know if people would argue with me or not or, or disagree with me, but I think sight unseen prices are more for like investor type markets when we're trying to commoditize things and you see people wanting to, uh, you know, hope that they can, uh, you know, get someone just to buy like every 81S silver dollar and 65 and they'll, you know, pay 105 and sell at 110 and it's kind of a commodity. But that's, you know, like I say today's environment is much, much more investor, um, I'm sorry, collector focused um, they can they when you know we have auctions these days collectors it used to be 25 years ago or 20 years ago <clears throat> if there was a rare coin auction by heritage uh dealers bought about 80 percent of the coins and that and de collectors bought about 20 percent and i would say that's been flipped now to collectors are probably by 80 to 90 percent of the coins and uh, dealers probably buy uh, 10 or 20 percent. So that's that's changed a whole lot over over the uh, the last uh, 20 some odd years. So that, that should give you we'll visit this a little bit later more about uh, using the gray sheet and the blue sheets. But I think that, that gives you uh, an idea of, of kind of the information that's available. And also so you don't have to be a dealer to subscribe to the, the gray sheet uh, or the blue sheets. I do think that the, anybody can get those. Um, <clears throat> so how I value uh, coins versus wholesale re uh, versus retail. So I mentioned, as I mentioned to you earlier, um, and I think covered a lot, a lot of it, is it has a lot to do with the, with the quantity of a coins available. So if um, if there's a if there's a, a bunch of something like uh, like you know, they just noted there and did a little bit of research, NGC's graded uh, over four million four million silver dollars. Now that's a lot of silver dollars. Um, and there's a lot of these coins that have populations of, well, I think I'm going to go down to the next slide, I think is, yeah. So here's, yeah, so there's some good information here. So this is, this is kind of really digging into the, into the weeds here a little bit to give you some pricing information. So as a professional, um, and probably I call it more of a high level professional, because a lot of the, there's quite a few coin dealers don't want to invest as much money as it costs to, to do this, but this is the, um, the CCE system. And, um, because I pay for uh, subscriptions to like gray sheet, blue sheet, um, I pay for auction records. Um, I pay for all the different, all the information that you can get on this system. It's around $500 a month, um, somewhere in that ballpark, four to $500 a month. 
So you can see pricing is very, very important to me. And uh, I do spend a lot of money to, to gain that, that access and information, but it is extremely valuable. And uh, it, you can, uh, you know, when you, you know, when you'll see, see the different things that you can, uh, all the different tools, well, you know, every, everyone's got their, like a, I'm like any other professional, I have a tool chest of what I do for the, for, the, for the work I do. And for me, it's not just important for buying and selling coins, but since I'm the senior editor for Redbook, I use a lot of this information as well um, because I, I need to be able to uh, you know, accurately uh, reflect those prices when I, when I do my book. Um, let me look at one other thing here, one sec. Um, I was gonna tell you up a little bit here. See, I don't have the population reports there. I'll have to show you. Well, I can show you, uh, let me show you something earlier. Okay, so this one, uh, this one, this slide does, uh, oh, there it is. Okay, I see it now. I, I kind of lost it in, in the, uh, I was looking at the, the different, I was looking at the higher lines. So if you look at here, let's say, uh, we're gonna look at it as a comparison here, 1881 S Morgan dollars. So this is where it becomes uh, more of a, uh, 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 you know, I could say more of a, it gives you it gives you the idea of of how rare versus you know other coins that are that are more common. The 1881 is silver dollar in MS65. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't. The slide doesn't go all the way over to 65. It only gets this. It, it kind of broke off at 60. Uh, I mean, at 64, it breaks off at 65. But um, on the MS64 silver dollars, uh, there has been graded 112, 111,000 of them just at NGC. So in that coin, when if uh, I don't have the pricing on it, but let's say an MS65 coin. Oops, MS65 of that coin is gray sheet uh, is $135. Um, the blue sheet is $120. And there's uh, uh, CD, the CAC is $144. So you can see that coin is, that's almost like a, that coin is almost like a commodity. Um, and if you wanted to buy a bunch of those, um, you could you could round those up, and you wouldn't have any trouble trying to find those. So as you can see, you know, there's a population out there somewhere of over a hundred thousand coins that are either investors' hands, collectors' hands, um, and that's just NGC. P uh, PCGS is probably graded a similar number, if not more. So you've got almost a quarter million coins of this one coin. So. Um, if you if you know that uh, you know let's say the gray sheet bids I think on the 64s is more like seventy five dollars, but you shouldn't have to pay one hundred twenty five dollars for a coin that that you know is gray sheet bid seventy five dollars and that there's uh, over a quarter million coins out there you know uh, available in the marketplace so that gives you an idea of you know the scarcity. Now, in comparison, you'll see the um, now we have the eighteen eighty four s dollar. They've only graded um, of that coin. They've only graded uh, 13 coins. So, of a coin that is only 13 coins uh, graded, uh, you know, versus you know a quarter million coins, you can see where all of a sudden that coin that coin becomes more like art. It, it's not gonna it's not gonna trade as a commodity. Um, it's gonna depend on what it looks like, how it looks like next next to its peers. Um, you know, professional coin grading services, you know, PCGS or NGC or one of the other, you know, ANAX or any, any of the other ones, you know, that's, they've given their opinion on it, but the marketplace is going to vote on what they really think that coin is worth. Now, the theoretically average coin, gray sheet is determined it's worth 110,000. Um, they've got a, uh, a blue sheet price of 95,000 on it. And as you can see up here uh, on the, on the, um, and it's, I don't know if I can if I can point. I guess you can see my mouse, you know, kind of going on that. But um, so the last time an 1884s dollar sold in PCGS in 2015, a very attractive coin brought $114,000. That's probably where the gray sheet came up with their price because they followed the auction records, you know, very very carefully, and that's probably where they they said, well, that sold for $114,000 then I'll assign a value to it of, uh, you know, 110,000 as a wholesale price. A CAC coin you see brought 123,000 the same year. And the CDN is assigned a, a price of that of 125. So you can see that they're, they're kind of following those pretty, pretty carefully. Um, an NGC coin sold for $88,000 in 2014. 
And I did a little bit of research. I took did a, a picture of that coin, and it was it was kind of uh, deeply deeply toned. So it was more of a reflection of it on its eye appeal. Is probably why it, it brought that. <clears throat> um, also, we'll talk about PCGS versus NGC a little bit later. But it also has to do with how many people collect the coins in, in the different series, and also the demand for set registries. So going back to um, you can see there. Uh, this is a commodity of some sort, even though I said coins really aren't commodities, this coin kind of leans toward that. This coin is more like fine art and is not a commodity. You know, 13 graded, that's a that's a very rare coin. Uh, I think an MS65, it's even, you know, it's probably just a two or three coins, three, four coins. It's really, really rare. Um, now, when we get to uh, auction records, so let me see what all the information I've got. Okay. Um, so, Auction records are, this is this is probably one of the things we need to spend a little time uh, talking about in more in detail. So auction records have become um, one of the most widely used tools for professionals. Um, and I'm sure retail as well, uh, depending on uh, how sophisticated you are. Now, if you're, you know, if you're buying a 99 NS penny and in, in, in XF or something, you probably aren't as concerned about uh, uh, auction records. But if you're buying a 1909 S VDB and MS65 red, you know it's it's critical information. So uh, auction records are are very very important. People look at them, they use them, you know, for that because that's as we said earlier, a uh, a price guide is for a theoretically average coin. It's for uh, a guess at what a coin could be worth, you know, an educated guess of of its value. But an auction record is what someone wrote a check for it. So that tells you a lot more. Um, uh, I don't want to tell you a lot more, but it, it gives you, obviously, it's, it's, it's very important information because it tells you what a coin actually traded hands for. So, um, you know, a willing buyer and a willing seller. So that's, uh, you know, it's, I'd say that's, that's like what someone buys it, you know, if they come to appraise a house in your neighborhood, you know, they're going to want, they, one of the first things they do is they look for comps in your, in your area. And they want to see what you know other houses sold for per square foot, and you know the same sort of thing. So it's they use that all that information. Now a lot of people, um, you know, there's a debate. So are auction records wholesale or retail prices? So uh, there's valid arguments on both sides of that. And um, you know when you say that, uh, let's say a guy, you know, a coin dealer buys a coin in auction, well he obviously he's going to try to make money on it. So that coin probably traded closer to a wholesale price. Um, if a coin sells, if a collector buys it, and he might be got it at a wholesale price, and uh, you know that that was uh, you know that was a bargain, or maybe he had to battle against another collector, and he paid twice what the coin's worth because he's you know he just damn well wanted to own the coin. So um, it it you know it's not as uh, it's not it's not a clear cut. So there's you know and that change like I say that 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 uh, that uh, equation has changed a lot over the years. Because a long time ago, 80% of the coins were bought by uh, dealers, and, and uh, now it's probably 80% bought by collectors. Um, so when you look at auction records, you've got to take that in with a, a, with a, a little bit of, um, you have to, uh, I guess you have to understand that there's, there's different ways of looking at them or what they can really mean and, and how they do it. And we'll talk about that a little bit more so that you understand it. Um, when I say there's a large amount of data available, I kind of highlighted here for you for the heritage auctions. If you... Uh, now, the Heritage Auctions and uh, also Stacks Bowers, um, all the other auction houses, Legend Numismatics, um, Great Collections is another one, um, eBay, all of these, all these companies, auction companies now have, um, if, we'll, if you're willing to sign up as a, a member of their company, uh, like a member, you don't have to buy anything, I don't think, um, but you have to be registered. You can access this auction information, and that information uh, is usually what they have. So the information I had before, uh, let's see, oh, as you can see here, uh, up here, this is a consolidation of all the companies. So that tells me kind of more like, uh, you know, there's that, that uh, on this one was Legend, uh, Numismatics, Heritage, uh, Goldberg's there, uh, Stax Bowers over here. Um, so th this is a consolidation, but individually you can, uh, whoops. Then individually, you can go to these companies and uh, and sign up on their services, and you can um, access their their data. And you can see with with Heritage alone, they've got four hundred sixty two thousand 
uh, silver and silver silver dollar and related auction records in their database. That's that's a massive amount of information, and um, you know they have a what's good about uh, like heritage and, and some of these uh, these like you know great collections and some of these things. Their auction records they extend to, they have like weekly sales. They have um, their mega platinum sales. They have their regular auctions. So they've got every, you know, there's a lot of records you can get. You can find out when the last 1881S silver dollar and MS65 sold in, in one of their sales and what it brought, and also a high resolution image of the coin. So that's a, that's really good, uh, being a good be able to tool to be able to use. And um, I would I would think that, uh, you know, this, these auction records, that's something if, you know, regardless of what you collect, <clears throat> you should understand how to use that. Even if you're collecting, um, 09 S pennies, or, or if you're collecting silver eagles at MS 69, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. You can either go to eBay, you can go to, you know, some of these other, these are the other places and um, educate yourself and see what other collectors have been having to pay for these coins when they sell, uh, when, when they do sell on, on these different systems. Um, now, the one thing uh, I think is a good time to talk about it. Let me look at here. Uh, CCE. You know, these are like silver dollars here, different place. So one thing to tell is kind of how to use these auction records. I want to go back to the 84S dollar. So, um, <clears throat> so there's some, some things to take into consideration with auction records. Now, this is very, very, very important. And you know, keep this in mind. And I have to actually keep this in mind when I buy coins or, or sell coins, because um, you know, when you when you look at a number, um, let's say let's go over here to the MS 63, uh, 1884 S dollars. You see, uh, the last in two, two, uh, on February of 2020, about a year ago, an MS 63 sold for $26,400. An NGC went sold for $24,000. <clears> so how do you use that information? And so if you look at that information, you say, well, that was what, uh, a that coin brought twenty six thousand four hundred dollars. Well, if you wanted to buy that coin, let's say you were in the market for an eighteen eighty three S dollar, and you say, "Well, I, I would have, I would have bought that coin for, I, if another one shows up. I want to pay twenty six thousand four hundred dollars, well, or or less." Well, the reality is, of if that's a, that's a probably a rare coin, and if you were to bid on that coin, there's no assurances that you would have bought the coin for twenty six thousand four hundred dollars. As a matter of fact, you wouldn't have bought it because someone else was already willing to pay that. So you would have had to have paid uh, at least one bidding increment more than that to have bought the coin. So if that coin was at 26,400, next increments 5% higher, it would have been 27,500. You know, another guy bids, the next thing you know, it's 29,000. So uh, when you see a, one of these auction prices, uh, keep in mind the fact that you may have, you know, because I, I, I do this you know, often myself, I look at auction prices, I have to remind myself, like there was a sale this last weekend by uh, Heritage and Stax Bowers had big auctions. And when I review those for information to try to educate myself what coins are bringing, I have to remember, remind myself when I look at it, it says, wow, I would have I bought that coin, it, it, that was a good value. I gotta remember, I couldn't have bought it at that price. That was, that was what someone else was willing to pay for it. And I'd have had to beaten that person in the auction to have bought it at that price. So when if I look at it, I had to think, well, would I have paid one more increment to have bought it as a minimum? And it could have been uh, could have been even higher because some people, you know, you don't know what their bidding limit was. So you got to keep that in, in mind. Now on the other on the other end of the spectrum, when you're selling coins, let's say you have an 1883s dollar, an MS63, and it's a uh, last one brought twenty six thousand four hundred dollars. So you say, well, I'd like to get twenty six thousand dollars, you know, for that coin. Well, the buyer of that coin may remind you that if, if you'd have put that coin in one of those auctions, you'd have had to pay 10 to 15, sometimes 20% for the privilege of having that coin in that auction and offered to all these retail buyers. So just because a coin brought $26,400 doesn't mean if you have a similar coin that you can put a coin in auction and net that same price. So you need to, you know, these are tools that you can use when you're either negotiating or buying or studying or whatever you want to call it. But when it comes down to the practicality of actually buying or selling a coin, you have to take those two key pieces of information uh, as, as a, uh, you know, a factor when you're trying to figure out either what to ask for a coin 
or what you might want to pay another person for the same coin. And then, like I said earlier, you could look at your coin or a similar coin and look at it. It's okay, that coin had brought twenty six thousand two hundred dollars, four hundred dollars. You know, was that coin frosty white or is it? Did it have big splotches on it? Um, you know, that that that's a really important information. So um, when you do use auction records, um, you know, I've always told people to try to specialize in something and try to understand the series they're dealing in. And the more they understand it, the the better they'll they'll be able to use these tools as they uh, you know as they pro, uh, progress forward in, the, in their collecting and, and I think that'll that'll be uh, you know very 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 important with what you do so um, study the study the uh, the when you when you especially if you see anomalies like you know if you see here like you know wow why why did that CAC coin bring that much money and uh, you can click through the heritage website and you can look at the picture of it and <clears throat> most likely you'll be able to you know give it'll give you an idea of why why it would look like that and why it would have brought that it might have been, you know, undergraded or, you know, someone thought it was, you know, uh, and that's another thing with auction records, you've got to be careful about. Sometimes people will, um, you know, some of the, a lot of, especially professionals, they look at coins and they'll, they'll pay the next grade up for a coin if they think it will upgrade because they, they run it, they're very, very aggressive and, you know, playing that, what we call the upgrade game. So when you look out for outliers, um, you're mostly looking for averages when you're trying to use auction records and also see how it applies to the series that, that you're involved in or trying to figure out. Um, so there's the auction records we're talking about that. So I think that gives you a, a, a kind of a better understanding about how those you know can be a tool, but you also there's there are nuances involved with understanding how to use those tools. Um, now this is uh, I'm just going to familiarize a little bit with the, some of the systems. Um, CCE is one of them. Now CCE is kind of a successor of what they call the teletype system. That was a long, long time ago. Um, it kind of morphed into, it, it, basically what the CCE is, is two things. Um, it's people who are posting bids on as many coins as possible. They're saying, I'll pay, uh, I don't you know, $2,300 for MS65, St. God and Double Eagles, uh, NGC or PCGS. They have to be no spots. So there's a, there's a, there's a, that's, there's that system of bidding. Um, the uh, CC is also um, has information where people they use it for posting like uh, you know uh, you know have you heard about this guy or is it you know by know if his credit is good so there's a lot of personal information on that system as well um, there's 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 uh, the CCC system there's uh, the uh, roundtable uh, trading is a, another one that that's on fits of Facebook groups uh, and the coin dealers helping coin dealers uh, another one. Um, CD exchange. Um, there's there's quite a few professionals uh, of these trading networks that people are, as you as you as you all know, information is valuable, and people are willing to pay to have it. And um, as a professional, I know there are critical tools in my tool chest to be able to know that when I get offered a coin, I need to be able to figure out you know what to pay for it. Um, you know, and like I was looking at this one here, just for instance, like there's a coin that brought six hundred and sixty dollars. I don't even know what coin it is right now. We're looking at, but the, another one about the same month uh, brought thirty nine hundred dollars. So it's, you know, you sometimes you have to dig a little deeper to see these, um, the, the, you know, this, how to use this information and use the tools, and the uh, these systems um, uh, are very are very very important. Um, and the one thing is, if you are a collector and you want to access some of these tools that you don't want to be, you know, you don't want to pay, most collectors don't want to pay $400 a month to get, you know, data. Um, work with a dealer who does have that information, um, who will work with you and share information with you. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to share as much as I can with my clients because I know that the more they know, the more they'll be, you know, uh, feel comfortable making it a purchase decision or a sell decision when they go to do something. So um, if you're, you know, if you love, you know, Jefferson Nichols, you know, find a person who's an expert in Jefferson Nichols, and that person will probably share with you some of these tools that he has, and he works with when it comes to making these, uh, these, these, uh, trying to find this information and be able to use these tools. Um, now, so this is one of the, um, the, the big ones, uh, people talk about how to value uh, PCGS versus NGC. And <clears throat> there's, um, this is a, kind of a good picture, because, so, um, when we put this together, we, there's a MS65 from the Simpson collection of a high relief, and there's an MS65 plus from the uh, Simpson collection of the of the same coin. And um, it, there's so there's there's different 
uh, variables with uh, that goes into these decisions about these things. Um, there are people who collect only NGC coins. Um, there's people who collect only PCGS coins. There's people who um, who uh, you know very rabid about the registry uh, set collecting uh, on either service, and they will only buy coins from those services because that that fits into the collection they've got. Um, you've got also uh, you know some people. Um, you know, this, this is really nuanced and I won't go into that, but there's some people who are experts that say that ONGCs, um, you know, they're more competent on, let's say, I don't know, a, a some, you know, silver dollars, let's say, I'm just making that up, or, you know, NGC, PCGS is much better if you've got, you know, modern silver eagles or, or something, you know, vice versa. So people have, you know, biases and prejudices about which services they think, you know, grade better or, you know, um, you know the coins look better. The uh, resale abilities is uh, is is important. You know, if you collect a if you collect a series where you know most of the, the important collectors uh, only collect PCGS coins, then you know if you buy an NGC one and you've, you've excluded those collectors when you go to resell it. The same thing for NGC. Um, you know the you know people who uh, you know it's people who are happy with the coin as long as the coins uh, certified, and then there's people who are picky and only want an NGC coin. So it's um, you, you know, that's, that's for probably, you know, more specialized series in general, a lot, I found most, a lot of my clients, uh, will buy either and they're happy as long as they can find the coin, because a lot of times you don't have the, the, the luxury of, uh, finding the coin exactly what you want. Uh, I mean, there's some collectors who do it, but I hate to see anybody buy a coin in one service and then downgrade it. So they can put it just so they can put it in their collection because they need it in their collection, even though they're willing to have a lower grade, you know, even though it's the same coin, they'll have the other servers put it in a lower grade holder. So I, I hate people who do that, but you know, that's part of the game and people play and part of what they do to, you know, to, to work on their registry sets because some people are so much, you know, registry set collecting is such a big part of the hobby. It's probably, <clears throat> I would say, you know, registry collecting is probably one of the biggest uh, forces that have, um, uh, influenced our hobby in the last uh, 20 years. Um, you know, obviously the internet had a bigger impact or, you know, spreading the hobby, but um, a lot of the collecting action, people, people love to compete with each other. Um, they, they love the uh, uh, competition. They love the search. They love beating people out at auction for a coin to beat them by points. And it's, uh, it's set registry collecting is a very, very powerful influence in our hobby. And um, I guess, I would hazard to say it's almost like an addictive behavior because people, like once they start into it, they 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 go. I mean, I've seen people spend a million dollars on, uh, you know, will it easily on a Washington quarter set? You know, I don't know. I think a set of Washington quarters just sold last week. I wouldn't be surprised if it brought a million dollars. It was a you know specialized collection uh, that was in a Stacks Bowers auction. So, you know, people pay crazy. You know, if I I've, I've always kidded people that if I could take a time machine and go back in time that the one thing I wish I'd have done, you know, 30 years ago was buy, you know, high grade uh, Franklin half dollars and Washington quarters and Jefferson nickels and, and put them away because you could have bought coins for $20 in those days that are selling for $20,000 now. So uh, it, it was uh, crazy how people have become uh, so competitive with these finest knowns of these different issues. So it's a really big influence on the hobby. But, um, but in general, going back to this, uh, the PCGS versus NGC, um, you know, it's also regional somewhat. Um, I know a lot of people that live in uh, the southeast. I mean, I'm sorry, um, uh, yeah, the southeast of the United States that for, prefer NGC because they can drive there. For instance, they got issues with the collections. Um, they like the customer service at NGC. You know, various reasons. Then the same reason for PCGS. You know, they kind of dominate uh, collectors on the West Coast. So uh, people over there on uh, in California and you know in that in that general part of the country, you know, obviously like their kind of their home. I guess you call it their home team. So there is some ge geographical um, of preference, but uh, like I say, a lot of my clients, uh, I I buy and, I personally probably buy and sell uh, an equal amount of, of the of the companies uh, of the of the different ones because I I kind of buy whatever comes along and uh, when I have the opportunity to purchase and I'm happy to buy either. So. Uh, now, <clears throat> this is a, a very complicated one. Um, this kind of goes to a, this is a subject that uh, I am not an expert on. And it's, uh, I don't, I think there's, 
I don't know if people consider themselves experts on it, but to me, it's it's a it's a lot of a lot of guesswork and a lot of um, you know kind of goes back to what I said before. You don't really know something's worth until pe- two people battle it out for it. But um, the coin on the left. So I'm, hope, I'm hoping this is a, a pr- pretty good illustration about this. The coin on the left is a coin I actually recently owned. Um, just sold it last week. But as you you saw before, it had a gray sheet bid of one hundred and ten thousand dollars. Um, I sold this coin for closer to ninety thousand because it is um, it's it's not beautifully toned, uh, but it's not it's not like black or anything. But it's um, it's you know it's not frosty white in the way a lot of people would like a, a, one of these coins. There's only population is only ten or eleven, but of those ten or eleven, um, this coin I would say is probably closer to average or you know maybe slightly less than average that people would want as far as I appeal. Now you look on the right and you see how that coin's got vivid blues and greens and, and oranges. Now, if the 84S dollar on the left had color similar to that coin, uh, that coin would probably be worth closer to $125,000. And the 81S dollar is a fairly common coin and an MS65, that coin could be worth, you know, it's let's say if it, if it was just an average MS65 is probably worth $150 retail, $140, something like that. You know, I wouldn't be surprised to see if you saw an auction record of that coin bringing $500. And I've seen some cases where I had a coin recently that uh, I forget what the data on it was. I think it was an 810 and MS64. You know, I think Gracie bid was two or $300 and I put it in an auction and the coin brought $4,000. So if a coin, um, uh, you know, it's, they, as we mentioned earlier about coin versus commodities, when it comes to tone coins, you really are dealing in fine art, in my opinion. I, you can quote me on that. It's, a, uh, it, it's not a commodity. It's far from it. Um, uh, toning is kind of like looking at a, a, you take the same coin. It's kind of like, you know, not all Picassos are the same. You know, some are his fine periods, some of his, you know, lesser periods. And, uh when you look at colors, there, there's, there, there are literally no price guides for beautifully toned coins. So it is completely a guess. And if you want to understand uh, toning on coins, then um, you're pretty much um, uh, you're, you're, you're pretty much restricted to try to uh, look at auction records. You, if you don't use auction records, um, you're going to have to, or I even seen the coins in person because it's very, very confusing. Um, I've seen coins bring for, you know, 10 times their, their value for uh, its catalog price and, or sometimes they'll bring 20% premium. So it's, it's really kind of a wild west of coin pricing. And, um, I do urge caution, you know, when you see a coin, you think it's pretty, you know, be careful, don't get too carried away. Cause you know, you got to make sure someone else, when you go to sell it, it's going to think the same thing about the coin and really, really love it. So, um, you know, but you know, I, I'm always amazed by them. And as a matter of fact, if, if, I, if I run across a, a really uh, beautifully toned coin, I am reluctant to actually sell it, um, to price it to anyone. I usually put it in auction because I wanna see what two people were willing to pay for it. As I just mentioned earlier, I sold a coin for 10 times its catalog value. And I would have, if, I'd have, if you'd have forced me to price a coin to you, I would have probably priced it to you at you know, twice catalog. I would have been, uh, I would have sold it grossly under underpriced it. So I've seen it many, many times. And, um, uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, when coins are deeply toned, they can sell for deep discounts. You can see coins that if they're dark. Um, another factor or two in the tone coins, because the services have what they call conservation services, where you can, they'll take a coin, like this 81S, 84S dollar, like I just mentioned, oh, you've got coin was frosty white. Well, they would look at that coin and say, well, you know, if we conserve that coin, and let's say what they, they call, uh, you know, dip it uh, in, in jewel luster, that coin may not turn out very nice and it could be, you know, stains on it. So they would probably decline to take that chance to do it. Um, but there's other coins that if it's, um, if it's got unattractive toning and it's deemed like it'd be worth a lot more, you know, it might be better to take an unattractive coin and, um, and have it conserved so it actually has better eye appeal. But that is like for super specialists and be very, very careful. So uh, don't buy a coin at a deep discount uh, to, the, to the catalog values because you think you can dip the coin or clean it. You make sure you show it to somebody who kind of knows what they're doing, has an understanding of, of that process and can help you with the downside in case you have a train wreck. I've, 
I've seen many of my professional buddies lose thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars on a coin that they thought they could conserve and it, and it, and it turned out awful. So uh, that's, that's cer certainly something you should, uh, and like I say, both services now have that, have offer the conservation, um, but just so, I don't know if you understand how that works, but when they look at a coin, they evaluate it and they'll let you know whether or not they would uh, suggest taking that chance on, on doing that with a coin. And they will guarantee they'll put it in the grade if they'll do the work, but they probably only do the work about half the time. So that's a, that's something that's a little bit complicated. So anyway, tone coins versus uh, you know not tone coins. That's a that's a that's an interesting subject, and you know you have to just learn it by experience by looking at them. Um, now there, this is a, another another one here, so another nuance that you'll run across occasionally is how do you value plus coins? And then this coin is even um, further; it's got a star on it. So just so you understand what that means on this coin. So this is an 1884 um, dollar. About three or four years ago, I handled a, a, a treasury hoard of, uh, of, of Morgan silver dollars worth like 13,000 coins. And I sold them and I kept the very best coin for myself. I just I kept that one coin. And um, this coin came back MS66+. Plus. There were actually some 67 coins in the hoard, but I thought this coin was prettier. So I kept it because of the toning. And the fact that it was a it was a 66 plus, and the star uh, for NGC, what the star means, it means it has superior eye appeal, and in this case, that's translated into the to the, to the attractive toning. Um, the coin actually, that's the, the photograph photograph of that's just taken with an iPhone, so it's not like high art photography. It's got a lot of beautiful colors, and um, you know it's radiant. And this would be a good example of. Um, of a coin that uh, I would tell you that I would not sell that coin uh, to anybody individually. If I were to sell that coin, I would probably only put it at auction because an MS66 8400 catalogs around $300, a 66 plus um, it probably is more like a $500 coin, but I wouldn't be surprised to see this coin bring uh, $5,000 because of the, the color its pedigree and um, and it's uh, you know the star and the plus. So when you start doing some of these all these these extra extra bells and whistles, it changes. You know it's almost hard to use some of the price guides. Um, you know uh, just kind of like you know per se just looking at them. You gotta you gotta add some uh, some art to it. Um, see, so this I might have I should I should have talked about this a little bit more uh, earlier, and I think we've touched on it, but. Um, the grading grading reports um, are probably the creation of grading reports are probably the most important advance in numismatic knowledge that that's that's probably happened in my career. Um, it's uh, you know I've been around for forty over forty years, forty five years now going on, and you know there's you could have studied you could have memorized every book in the in the in the library you could have uh, studied everything you could have been an expert in different series. But population reports are, are they, they've taken the things that we maybe thought might have been how rare this coin was, we would have, you know, information and it totally quantifies it. So you know now how rare most coins are. Um, the only variable is that, you know, are there some out there have not been graded yet? Um, the other variable is occasionally a coin gets upgraded or downgraded. And that's a, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But those, uh, in most cases, about 90% of it is pretty solid information. Um, when grading reports first came out, when they when the grading companies first started grading coins, um, the like classic commemoratives had a fairly low population, an MS66 or 67, and a coin, um, a New Rochelle might have been bid at $4,000. And now, 30 years later, you know, we realize, heck, there's lots of those coins out there. There's thousands of them. And that coin now probably bids three hundred dollars. So um, these population reports are they they you know they what drive a lot of the uh, said registry collecting because people want to know like you know what is you know if I want to buy the finest one what's the finest grade available? Um, it lets you know that if you want to uh, go it circles back to what I said earlier if you want to buy a coin uh, if you look and see there's there's fifty of a coin you know you got a good chance of maybe finding one uh, the next year or so. If there's 500 of a coin, you could probably find it today on the internet somewhere. Some dealer might have it. Um, if there's only 
two graded, then, you know, it might be a once in a, uh, you know, it could be once in a generational opportunity when the coin becomes available. So that information is super important. It doesn't matter what you collect, doesn't matter what grade you collect. Um, you should, you owe it to yourself to understand how to use population reports uh, in your coin collecting as far as, you know, how to value coins when you buy the coins. Because as I said earlier, if you were to buy a coin and there's a lot of them, you've got some negotiating power. If a guy has a coin that there's only one known of um, in that grade, then you don't have a lot of negotiating power. Either you want it at his price or you can take a chance that someone else may buy it and you may never have a chance to owning it. So it's, um, you know, and that, that extends into U.S. coins, world coins. These population reports um, are pretty extensive, uh, you know, for all the uh, coin, you know, both, both companies grade coins, tokens, metals, um, currency. You know, it's a, it's a wide, widely available numismatic tool that I, I urge every collector to and dealer to uh, fully understand how to use it. Um, good news is these days that you can get a lot of this information. You can be at a coin show or at a coin club meeting or a friend's house and you can pull it up on your cell phone. So it's not like you have to dig very deep to find it. Um, you can get that, uh, that you just need to be a member of the different uh, organizations like NGC and PCGS and they'll provide that, that information to you. So it's uh, very, very good. And um, I, I can't, I, you know, I, I gave a little analogy like when, uh, Morgan, when they first started grading Morgan dollars, I remember the, uh, you know, back in the 80s and 70s, you know, David Hall and, uh, you know, God bless him, he's a genius, but, you know, he would promote like, oh, 81S dollars or, you know, they're, I think at the time they're $500, $700 and like, oh, this is a great coin. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, and then, you know, he didn't really understand how many there are. There's thousands, tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand MS 65s. So there's the, you know, the, the true, true rarity of coins has been revealed. And now we know, um, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, collectors have more information now to make those decisions about, you know, how to value a coin and, and whether or not they want to, you know, pay that price for it. So learn how to use that tool. That's a good one. Um, let me see here. Okay, there we are. So I'm figuring out how to do it. So we, I talked about the, uh, in the, uh, the census. Um, this is a screenshot from um, NGCs, I call it the census report. And you can see there how they have United States coins. Um, then they got coins in different countries, China, Australia, they go all the way down, it's tokens and metals and everything. Um, there you can you see there, I, I wanna drill down a little bit uh, with United States coins. They have graded 31 million US coins. Well, that's a lot of US coins that have, it's, you could, you, that's a lot of data that you have at, at your, uh, uh, exp, uh, uh, as you as you use as a tool for your for what you're doing, you know Chinese coins. I was looking at they grade three and a half million Chinese coins. So that's that shows you how how much information. Um, <clears throat> when you hit U.S. coins, um, that tells you um, you can pick your denomination. They make it really easy. Just go in and pick the one you like. Um, you can see like uh, cents from you know that are from uh, you know 1793 to date. 1.2 million of them uh, of, of pieces have been graded. Two cent pieces, fourteen thousand coins. So that's that's a lot of a lot of two cent pieces that have been going through their doors. So I think you would. Uh, whoops, let's do it here. The uh, so there there's your there you go down. You can pick up like when you go to silver dollars, they have five million seven hundred eight uh, seven seven million five million seven hundred eight thousand silver dollars. Then you can go through. This is actually just really information. Just to, like if you're a collector or like a you know, for me, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm kind of a nerd when it comes to data with coins. I love, I like looking at that and it's like, wow, there's 351 Goldberg dollars and there's, you know, three and a half million Morgan dollars. It, it kind of gives you a real perspective on rarity. Um, uh, you know, the, you see the, even like even presidential dollars, you see a lot of these modern coins, the way they, way that have many have been graded. So it's really good information, just that it, it gives it kind of like a snapshots of rarity. And it does, it's, uh, it's very enlightening when you see the different information. Um, I drill down a little bit more. There's eight, there's Morgan dollars. And then you know, there you'll see uh, this is kind of how it how it looks when you see it. So the uh, 1878s will start at the beginning. 1878 um, eight tail feathers. They've graded 13,644 of them. Then it kind of works your way across. You can see <clears throat> the relative rarity uh, for the different grades. Um, you know this is 
you get to see how useful that tool is just by looking at that little chart that that's like a little snippet of a chart um i've had some articles i've written about how i really, really love uh, uh deep proof like uh silver dollars and here's a good reason you can see why i love it so much the um uh, the the I love that series like of the ms 65s of that coin they've graded 432 they've only graded three in in uh deep mirror proof like so it shows you how extremely rare that coin is in that grade and if you were trying to buy those coins you could see that if you had if you were trying to buy uh if a guy had one of those uh three coins you know he can almost name his price as opposed to a person who's got one of a coin here that they've they've either graded 4,800 of or 2,500 of. So it's it makes a big difference by knowing that information that'll make you a lot uh, a, a lot better chance of being successful. P, uh, now the same thing with the PCS population reports. I've done screenshots of these so, so you can have an idea of what they look like. Um, there's uh, PCGS is kind of like going when almost the same thing. There's US coins. Um, we circle down they have there's some charts like this and you can go in and pick out the different you know series that you want to find out about um you can do there's dollars they've got a broken down in a similar fashion morgan dollars and there's the same information uh you'll see it again uh virtually the same thing so um on the interestingly enough i just said about the 1878 uh uh, NGC is graded three uh, deep mirror proof likes. Uh, PCGS is graded three as well. They've graded twice as many 1878 eight tail feathers uh, in MS65. So you see, if you collected that series, that would give you a little more information about availability. So, uh, and you can use that for almost all the dates. So these are these are really 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 great tools. And I hope that if uh, by watching the the class today, you'll you'll did learn that this is something that you definitely want to put in your information that you use. Um, so uh, I mentioned this earlier before about uh, exceptions for a lot of kind of, you know, we're getting near near the end of our, our class here. So I wanted to talk about a few other things like some of the some of the exceptions and things. Um, <clears throat> when you get finest knowns of a coin, and if you've got a coin, there's only one known of, um, and there's it's a popular series. Now, if you have a coin that you have a finest known of a coin a series that no one cares about, that's not nearly as exciting as you have a finest known Morgan dollar. Or um, if you want to, uh, you know, if you got some of these other, you know, depends how, and, and also uh, both NGC and PCGS, you can go in and you can go to their set registry uh, section and you don't have to even, be, uh, you know, be a part of it as much. You, know, you probably have to register, but you can go in and see like how many people are putting together Morgan dollar sets or how many people are putting together two cent piece sets or those um, or, or different specialties. So you can kind of, uh, it's actually a really good thing to understand if you're a collector and you want to, um, you know, to be, a, to be a successful collector, you know, it's fun to collect something that no one else does, but again, when you go to sell your collection, it's also um, advantageous to have a series of people are going to be high demand um, and also the conditions that are going to be in high demand. So uh, think about that as you're a collector and, and when you're buying a coin, um, like I say, anytime you're buying a coin, I would always think about it in, in terms of resellability because, you know, ultimately, if you don't sell it, someone's going to sell it. So either you, you or your heirs are going to ultimately dispose of it at some point. So that you want to, you know, take all that information into consideration. But finest known is a um, is a big factor when it comes out to on the valuations. Um, this is an ext extreme exception. I call it an exception. It's one of those funny ones um, that you know everybody in the coin business was you know, uh, having a big time talking about and fantasizing about. So uh, in uh, 2019, June of 2019, this 1930 it dime and MS68 plus <clears throat> sold for $364,250. And what I understand about it on that sale, it was, um, and I laughed about it earlier, and it's totally, a total example of it. There were two collectors, at least two collectors, probably in this case, two collectors, who went head to head and uh, those collectors decided they wanted the coin, they weren't gonna let the other person have the coin. And they they did a battle royale and, and paid what you would expect it to have gotten, you know, you could have gotten a complete set of Mercury Dimes in, in MS65 uh, for the, or probably for less than, a lot less than that even. Um, so they, they did battle and this is, a, this is an outlier, you know, it's probably two billionaires, you know, that they're fighting over a coin more for bragging rights than it, you know, uh, there is, it's 
pretty much illogical, but I mentioned earlier, tone coins can bring very illogical pr t prices. And you can see this coin's beautifully toned and um, it kind of just caught the fancy and um, you can see, but you certainly wouldn't want to use that auction record as a comp, comp to pay uh, for any other example, because a <clears throat> MS66 uh, example might bring $50. So it's really, it's such an extreme, it's just kind of fun to see, you know, what can happen in the coin business. Um, this is uh, an interesting subject to talk about. Um, and we could talk about this for a long time, but I'll, I'm just touching on it. But it is uh, about resubmissions. So uh, I, I crack coins out all the time because I think, oh, a coin you know, could be higher grade or it might be to be conserved or, you know, or whatever. Um, and um, you can see there's some old green holders there, some coins that I thought were, were grade higher. And um, so when you're buying coins, um, you need to think about uh, you know, the resubmission and impact on population reports because the population reports, um, <clears throat> when you look at a one, some of them might say there's 15 coins graded of a grade, but then some coin dealer might have tried the same coin 10 times. So that could be very deceptive information. So when you look at population reports, you got to think about the impact that submissions that might have had on that series and are those population numbers exactly accurate. And that's probably, you know, fairly uh, a little bit more over the head of some people and you might have to um, uh, you know, seeks experts in different series that really, really, really know, you know, in that series to understand that. But um, the, the uh, population reports are good information, but they're, they're not a, a thousand percent accurate because there, there is the subject of, of resubmissions and how that, you know, not everyone said the tags in over the years. I know lots of guys just throw them in the trash and, and don't uh, try to help the, the grading services. If you send them in, the grading services will take them off of the, um, off of the, the, uh, the reports. And then the, they try to make them a little more accurate um, um, when they have that so that the, that information, they, they make a big effort to make it as, as, as accurate as possible. Okay. Um, next is um, when you're pricing coins and you, you're, you see anomalies that happen, you, you, you can be, you might be conducting a series and let's say Liberty Nichols are, are probably a good, uh, well, actually both of these coins are good examples of something that's happened in the last, oh, 10 years, uh, or maybe five to 10 years, maybe less. Um, both of these coins dropped precipitately in the price guides. They probably dropped uh, 30, 40%. And uh, some people are like, oh, you know, what, what happened? It's like, oh my gosh, coin prices are crashing. And, and, um, and you know, what caused that? Um, well, I know, I know for a fact on both of these coins, the 1912S nickels went down probably 50%, maybe, maybe even more, because of someone found an original roll of those. It might have even been more than that. It's kind of a secret. They no one knew exactly. But the population of that coin in MS65 and MS66 soared. The same thing happened on 09 SVDB pennies. There were um, at least a roll, possibly two to three rolls, of just absolute gem, 1909 SVDB pennies. And I think MS67 coins dropped in price from over 100,000 to, to less than half of that. So um, sometimes when you see uh, anomalies in the, in the price guides or you see things that change, it's not because the market went down, uh, just because it went down, it actually went down because of the supply and demand factor that for at least temporarily, the supply exceeded the demand and the coins came down in price. Um, usually this self-corrects over time and the coins will get absorbed. Um, and then sometimes if someone properly, you know, uh, distributes a hoard, you know, the prices can actually even go up sometimes if, if they get it in enough hands and they don't, you know, don't uh, get, uh, you know, flood. You know, uh, sadly though, how many people collect, you know, MS65, Jeff, I mean, Liberty Nichols, it's fairly limited. So it, you know, the, the supply obviously exceeded the demand for quite a while. SCB pennies, they, I think they've actually started to bounce back now. They were, it, they've probably come back up 10 or 20% from their low prices from where they were before. Um, I touched on this earlier about CAC. I'm sure a lot of people ask about that, how to, you know, uh, looking about CAC. I think the biggest thing you have to do is to look at the, uh, the price, the auction records, and you can see what things bring. Uh, and you know, what collectors are willing to pay for, for a coin in, um, with that CAC sticker. I had a client call me this morning. He says, I want to buy a, a 19, he wants to buy a 1908 two and a half Indian uh, MS64, but he wants a MS64 plus CAC. 
So I said, well, um, that's a that's a worthy that's a, a, a worthy goal to have as you're collecting, uh, but it may take a year or two to find one, if ever. And um, you know, you better you might want to uh, broaden your your what you want because you know the the population of those is fairly limited and they can be hard to find because uh, a lot of people you know, they like the security of having uh, another company look at it. Um, but it's, uh, you know, then, then you, you, you start, you start running into extra cost. So, uh, you know, it's a, you know, it's a very, very complicated subject on the CAC people, uh, you know, they're, it's widely accepted. A lot of people like it. Um, a lot of the auction companies send almost every coin they get there to try to get more money for them when they buy it, when they auction an estate, um, people like the, um, the idea there's someone else building, making markets in these coins. But then you have to. The only thing I caution is that you need to factor in the, the price, the pricing. So um, make sure that the the uh, when someone prices a coin to you, that the they haven't just doubled the price because it has a CAC sticker, for instance. And maybe it, it only deserves a ten percent premium or or whatever it you know the market uh, may figure. Um, and also CAC has our population reports as well, and you can use that information because if like I say this gentleman wanted to buy that one coin. You know, there may be one out there. Well, he's never going to find it. If there's 10 or 20, maybe. And if there's two or 300, good chance. So that's good information to actually know. Um, the CAC's gold stickers, I put that out just for fun. Those are coins that CAC has determined that uh, is the next grade up. But people like those coins just because they're almost a novelty. And they generally bring at, at least, well, I mean, as a minimum, they bring the next grade up in price. And then they sometimes bring two to three times that price. So it's really kind of a, um, it's more like a novelty collecting. Um, you know, I think if you, if you, if someone said they wanted to collect uh, CAC gold coins and I wouldn't even waste my time because they'll, they'll so seldom find one and, and that the chances are that they would uh, be willing to pay the price that one would bring, it'd be probably, uh, you know, probably minimal. Um, and also the, uh, um, uh, it's another coin that if I get one uh, in my possession, a lot of times I put it in auction because I want to see what the market will bear. You know, it's hard to even put a price on it. So much as I want to try to teach you guys about uh, valuing coins and learning guides, there's still some, um, a lot of art in it too, and I'm trying to figure out what it is exactly. Sometimes you just can't pin down an accurate price. Um, sometimes there's pedigree coins. Um, this coin was one of the series of Silver Eagles that uh, the a and uh, released. And just as an example of a signature series, this is mine. I, I got it when I was, um, you know, for being a a president from 2015 to 17. There are people that collect coins with pedigrees. Um, they, they like to know a uh, coin came from the Garrett collection. Fortunately, it's not the Jeff Garrett collection. It might've come from the John Work Garrett collection, which is far more valuable. But um, pedigrees like, you know, the uh, um, Newman collection, the, um, the, uh, Oh, I don't know. Catch! I think of a lot of them. You got uh, Pittman. There's, there's, you know, uh, Garrett. You know, the list goes on and on of, of great, great collections. Um, one of the books I did, uh, 100 Greatest U.S. Coins. In the back of the book, it has a list of uh, what I consider some of the greatest collectors of all time. And um, <clears throat> there's a list there, itemizing some of the people that you might be able to see with. Uh, sometimes they have a pedigree. In general, um, you know, excluding this coin, which is just kind of more of a novelty. But in general, if you have like a rare coin, I would say pedigrees will probably add about 10, 5 or 10% to the value of most coins if it's from an important collection. So you can, you know, depending on the series you collected, you can decide if that's an important collection or not. But um, I'd say that's a lot of people probably agree with that's so probably about, a, about an average because people love pedigrees, especially if um, the, 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 the price can be very justified itself more if it, the coin was photographed and it's in an auction catalog and you can see a picture of it and you can trace it to that coin and you can say there's the coin that was sold in that sale. So that's that's very important. Um, treasure coins are another uh, area that's uh, heavily collected and sometimes hard to price. Um, these SS Central America double eagles, they sell for about a 20 to 40% premium over uh, a coin of a similar grade that's not pedigreed. It's uh, most of the coins that are mint condition did come from the from that uh, from the uh, SS Central America, but um, there's an exception on these, so you have to be aware of it. So this is really important on pricing. Some people had bought, like say, this coin, and they thought, oh, this coin is a um, MS65 or 64. They want to upgrade it. They might get it upgraded, 
But then the grading service would say, oh, it upgrades, but um, they didn't put the pedigree on it because they'd cracked it out and didn't have the original documentation of the hoard it came from. So I would prefer to have an MS-63 plus with a uh, SS Central America pedigree than I would an MS-64 coin that was not pedigreed to the, to the treasure. So that, that chain of command with the pedigree is very, very important. And um, you do see some of these coins. So uh, be careful, don't buy a, a 57 S20 and just assume that it's worth more because it's in a holder. It needs to say on it, SS Central America. So that's very, very important. And they almost always, these treasure coins almost always make a big premium. Um, I'm trying to think, I had another one. Um, I had a picture of a, um, of a uh, coin from the SS Republic, a silver coin. It's probably worth 10 times more because of the pedigree from the Civil War era. Um, I'm starting to run a little bit short on time, so I'll speed this up a little bit. The um, another thing that's good, that's complicated in pricing is red, red, brown, and uh, and brown. Um, those coins you, you need to be careful when you buy these because on large on, on uh, any penny, large cents, uh, uh, Lincoln pennies, or uneven because uh, a coin might have been graded 20 years ago is a red, and over time it's co it's changed color to red brown. And those coins would auction. I, I saw just recently a big auction that had a whole lot of uh, MS65 reds in it. And the coins sold for about 45% discounts, 40, 40, 40 to 50% discounts because the coins had changed colors in the holder and they were no longer, uh, no longer uh, full red in color. So be careful with price guides. Don't just pay a price guide for a coin. You actually have to look at the coin and make sure that it's a current state of status corresponds to, to, the, to the grade in the holder. Uh, extreme rarities. Um, this is this a lot of the information I've already told you kind of applies to extreme rarities. Um, you've got population reports, uh, auction records. Um, and then the other thing I would throw into it is you need to really, if you're buying extreme rarities, unless you've been a collector for 10 or 20 years and you become an expert, you need to use the services of, a, of someone who's an expert in that series. I think it's well worth if you can get a good, a good advisor, someone to pay five or 10% to help you, give you advice, make sure you're getting the right coin. Um, Cause you know, some of these are like buying a house. Uh, some of them are like buying, a, you know, an apartment building these days, uh, you know, some of these coins are bringing, you know, five, 10, $8 million. So some of these extreme rarities these days are bringing humongous money. And um, there's a lot of the same, a lot of the same tools that, that I've talked about as far as pricing that you can use. And um, it all kind of applies, but I would throw in the extra information, um, extra fact that you should seek out the <clears throat> seek out the help of an expert. Um, bullion prices impact the prices of coins a lot. Um, you can see all these coins here are modern issues. Um, and you can see how, um, you know, gold going up right now, there's a huge demand for silver eagles and people are paying seven, eight, $10 an ounce over, gold, over spot silver just for coins that are uncertified. And that applies also to the to the certified coins. Um, the premiums right now on United States gold coins is higher than it's been in a long time. Two or three years ago, we were melting some of the uh, U.S. gold coins, like uh, you know low grade double eagles. Now they're bringing ten or twenty percent premium for uh, even just like low grade mint state coins. So the bullion impact uh, price it and it does in, impact the value of coins. It changes hourly or minute by minute. Um, so if you sell some coins, make sure you factor that in but also factor in the uh, premiums because those do change a lot. And um, if you're saying you're gonna buy, a, buy or sell a, um, uh, uh, a, a coin that's related to bullion, make sure you're, you're checking on current information. Um, modern coins, um, a lot of people like MS70 uh, and, and Pru70 of these uh, modern issues. I'm not, uh, <clears throat> I don't collect them myself. And you know, I don't, people, I think that's, it's mostly I think people will start off because they're, they're like silver dollars. It's hard to buy like a set of Morgan dollars in high grade, but you know, silver eagles are, are almost kind of like a, um, a gateway coin that you know, anybody can collect and with any budget. And they're very, very, very popular and they come out every year. And the only thing I would say is kind of like I did earlier, um, this is a coin that they make thousands and thousands of, tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand of. And you can uh, use that to your advantage to uh, check on prices and see what people are selling them for. Um, eBay, heck, there's when a 2021 Silver Eagle comes out, there's probably people selling them on eBay before they even the mints even put them on the dies yet. So uh, there's a there's a lot of there's you can use that pricing. Uh, there's a lot of people out there selling them, and you can use that to your advantage. So just do do price shopping when you buy modern coins, and you'll you'll probably be very very happy, or you're maybe happy with the person you, that you normally buy from. 
Um, so I'd like to summarize it now. Uh, now is the best time in the history of the hobby for collectors to buy coins at the lowest possible markups. And um, I think I've explained to you that um, by using the tools that are out there, understanding how to use those tools, um, it's, it's just a great time to be a coin collector because um, you can find any coin you want to buy almost if you put a little effort into it. Um, and you can also use the information that's available to you, um, to, you know, to be a successful collector and to use that, that, that information to your advantage. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, besides learning how to price coins, is also learning how to grade coins. So if you've never taken an a, &A grading class, um, I would highly recommend that. Um, if you want to be a successful coin collector, you need to learn how to grade coins. And even though you've got NGC, PCGS, a a you got all these people grading coins and the whole third party grading, you need to understand the difference. Like I mentioned many times in this presentation, all coins are not alike, and you need to understand the differences uh, between, you know, low end, high end, and uh, and average. So that'll 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 be a very very important to you. And even if you're not buying certified coins, you, you know, you need to you need to understand how to grade coins to be successful. So um, that'll be the end of it. I, I think that it gives us about five minutes for questions. I see we have about. 20 or 20 participants, and um, I'm happy to answer some questions if anybody has them at this time. Yeah, so there's two so far. Um, one, the first one, what with third-party grading services doing marketing grading or market grading, do you want price guide or reference that they might use when determining a coin's value and assigning its corresponding grade? Okay, read that for us. I mean, so I didn't quite understand the question, so read okay. that, say that again. With third-party grading services doing market grading, do you want price guide or reference that they might use when determining a coin's value and assigning its corresponding grade? I think that, as I mentioned many times in the talk, you need to understand what the coin looks like yourself, regardless of the coin was graded today, market graded. You know, you may think it's you know overgraded compared to A and A grading standards. You need to understand <clears throat> the more you have an understanding of where you think the coin falls into that into that um, uh, spectrum of grading, and then use the different tools that I've explained today to try to compare to other coins. So um, I would say use all the tools and also try to um, assess for yourself what you think the coin really looks like. Okay, <clears throat> sorry, and the next one, um, what does population information mean? Uh, well, I think we covered that pretty, that maybe that question came in before we got to it. So I think that that gives you, yeah, we, we went into that. I think it's one of the most important tools that a collector can have, um, use, learn how to understand how to use it um, and uh, go to both services and, you know, find the series you collect, you know, consider it like exploring uh, the hobby. You know, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I've been doing this for 45 years and I still do it myself. I'll go in and I like study it and, I want to understand relative rarity and, and, uh, and population reports is the best way of doing it. And uh, it's, it's really a very, very important tool. Okay, I think that's um, all of the questions so far. Uh, uh, there's some comments if you want me to read those, but. Okay, well, you can send those to me if you want and then uh, right. we can see what we can do it. So, um, well, I think that actually that it's, I must have timed this pretty well because it's uh, 357. So we, I, 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 did have, I did have on my thing here, um, a few case studies, like here's an 1851C gold dollar, MS61. Um, these are like some of the tools that I would use, you know, myself, I would say there's the, uh, you'll see its population is uh, 61 at NGC. So that tells me, you know, how relatively how rare it is. I go down a little bit further, I would look and I would see here, like the last one brought in um, November of 2020. That's down right down here in this information are about 2,640, um, even though the gray sheep is 3,000. So that might have been a, a, a slightly inferior coin. But then if you tried to buy it, it might have brought $3,000. So it's kind of in line with, with the values. So those are some of the tools I would have made to you know, try to buy, buy, with, buy that coin. There's a 52D gold dollar. We got um, one more question if you want to. Oh, sure. Yes. How rare is the half dollar 0128 small head? How valuable is it? And what is the population? Uh, what is it called? What coin is it? Half dollar 0 128 small head. Oh, that's an Overton coin. Um, I tell you what, you can share my info. I'm happy to, to research that for somebody. Yeah. My, my, you can, my, I think my, um, if you don't know it, my, it's, it's Jeff at Rare Coin Gallery. 
is my uh, dot com. Um, so if you want to, anybody has any further questions, that specific question, I'm happy to answer. That'll take a little bit of research, so I could, but I'd be happy to do that for them. And yeah. I will uh, dig a little bit and, and do that. And I, I do that almost every day for, for people. People call me up and ask me how rare coin is and what's the population on it, how, what should I pay for it and sell it. And that's, that's what I do for a living. And I do it all day, every day. And I'm happy to do it for anybody. Yeah. So I think that, do you want, or he put his, uh, do you want me to put the coin man for you email address or is there a different? That's fine too. Yeah. I have two email, coin man for you at AOL.com is fine as well. That's just the one I have memorized. Yeah, that's it. That I've been using that forever. I've been slowly changing to the other, but it's, the, it's, more okay. my, it's my branding, I guess, is that coin man. Yeah. So I put that in the chat for anybody that would like to reach out to to Jeff about anything concerning pricing or or things that he does. Um, thank you so much, Jeff, I, as okay. usual. Very educational. And OK, well, and, I hope everyone liked it. And also remind if uh, anybody's watching this, remind their friends that this will be available. I think it's taped at some point in the future. Yep. So yeah, you, can, you, can, you can share it with other people as well if they think it's information they like. So yeah, okay. so it should be up on the website and on YouTube by next week or by the end of the week, actually, because it's Monday. So okay. perfect. Thank you so much, Jeff. You have a great day. I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>